Hi everyone, my name is Hal Watts. Um, I've also given 30 presentations this week, so my voice isn't so good anymore about other things. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit first about who I am and how I ended up working on this. I think it, it sort of informs the approach I took to the problem. So I used to be a mechanical engineer and I'm very passionate about environmental issues. And when I went to the Royal College of Art, the focus there is not so much about solving things, but it's about showing things. So a lot of my work um, was about visualising problems. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll, I'll use that picture. Um, a lot of my work is about visualising problems. So I'd look at things like water scarcity, and, and I was looking at numbers. They always end up being massive numbers, like thousands and millions of tonnes that are very intangible and people don't really understand them. So I do things like visualise those problems using sponges that I pour water on to make them larger, depending on the country that uses the most water and stuff like that. And it seems, it seems silly, but it's very hard for people, if they don't have an emotional response to these problems, to actually bother to do anything about them. I had another project similarly that was looking at um, bottled water. So I built a pump that uh, you could pump and you could get bottled water out of it, but you had to input as much energy as was required to produce that bottle of water. So if you wanted a glass of water, you had to pump for three hours. And that made people understand that bottled water does actually contain a lot of energy, or embodied energy in it. And then the... I wonder if any of these pictures work as well then. An extension of that for my final year project was I was looking for problems that I felt were very visual. So Greenpeace is forever showing us pictures of um, turtles with plastic stuck on them or birds. And although that is a serious problem that needs to be addressed, it, compared to the other problems, it's actually completely insignificant. Uh, I mean, that's representing less than 0.1 of a percent of plastic waste, but somehow it gets a lot of press. And I was trying to find problems that are significant that I thought could get as much press if they were addressed correctly. And the thing I, 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 I latched onto was, was e-waste. There's um, a famous photographer called Peter Hugo who'd gone out to, to Abu Roshi in Ghana and he'd done a set of incredible photographs of the situation out there. And I thought that if there was a solution that could be provided to this, it was something that would be really easy to market which is, a, is a, not a very nice term to use in that sense, but it is necessary to market these problems if we want them to be solved. Uh, let's see if this video plays. That'd be good. I think the internet's just too slow up here, isn't it? So anyway, the, the way I ended up looking at e-waste was because of this photographer's work. So I didn't really know anything about e-waste. Um, I started looking at a lot of statistics. I started visiting recycling centres in Europe. And it seemed that, although now Federico's informed us that actually the European system isn't much better than what they have in Ghana, um, I, I felt like the European system was doing fairly well, but there seemed to be this massive lack of e-waste and, and no one really seemed to know where it was going, or if they did, they didn't really want to talk about it. Um, so I flew out to Ghana uh, and started going around Abu Bloshi and looking at problems and problems that I thought were solvable. And it, it comes clear quite quickly when you're there that probably the most damaging practice in terms of health um, is definitely the burning of the wire. So environmentally, the impact of that is massive and also on the, on the health of the people doing it. And it seemed like in Europe we had a really good solution to that, which was giant cable shredders. But because what Frederico was saying about the fact that it's a very dispersed economy and that if you just try and go there and set up a business in the way that the West recycles, it probably won't work. And China had a lot of experience where they set up huge recycling plants and then they couldn't actually get any waste there because the food chain is such that waste gets collected by people and it instantly has a value. And even the people who have waste in their homes, they ha they, it has a value to them. They think that that's worth something. So if you're doing a, a Western model of recycling, you've got to gather a lot of waste to make that work financially. Um, the plants, in, for example, around London, the machinery costs hundreds of thousands, even millions, and you have to have a throughput of tons a day to make that work. And no one in Ghana has that throughput. Everyone's doing their small little bit, and they can't afford that sort of investment. I realise now that... Are these pictures going to work? Okay, some pictures... So this is what I, what I found when I was in Ghana. Um, it's quite an impressive place. And you've probably seen loads of these pictures by now because I think, especially since I've been and a lot of other people have been and, and distributed images of this, it's become almost a cliche now. Um, but 
it is a it is a real problem that is very visual and I think that's important because it's one that people see and they think about and also the fact that this waste that you're seeing in these pictures is ours I mean you can go and look at it and you find names of companies on it names of ministries like this this is coming from from the west and and people are super resourceful like like was being said by Yasmin they build lots of stuff out of this everything is recovered and used for something and one interesting thing actually that I found when I was out there is that everyone knows their body weight because everyone wants to check the scales and not cheating them so because everything's sold by weight everyone knows how much they weigh <laughs> which is really weird because you've got all these guys working on diets who know their exact body weight as if they were you know on a diet or, or athletes and they're really surprised if you don't know your body weight so the solution that I started developing was a way of recycling copper without burning it that would work in a sort of cottage industry. And so I started. Look, I looked at loads of ways of doing this, and the, the best was actually mineral water, fizzy water. If you pour fizzy water on shredded, shredded plastic and copper, all the plastic floats instantly um, for reasons that a chemistry friend of mine explained to me. And But... Carbonated water is not massively available in Ghana. Um, so I started looking for other solutions, and it seemed that a good good place to look was recycling industries, but not necessarily uh, big machines, but how they pan for gold. So gold can be done on a cottage industry basis really effectively. So I started developing a way of panning copper out of plastic. Uh, and the way it works is that the copper goes, the cabling you can put in this, in the hopper in the back of the bike, you pedal, and it shreds up all the wiring, and you end up with a, with a big bag of bits of plastic and bits of copper. And then you have to separate the two. And that's where the panel comes in. So all of it's powered by the bicycle. And the way it works is you put all the material in the bottom here. And this rotates around. And water flows over it. And the heavier particles of copper slowly rise up and fall through the hole in the middle. But the plastic gets washed out. And this was working relatively well, but I, I never got the chance to finish it fully. So this was a piece I did. I did this work in 2012. And I got a small grant to work on it a bit more. I've, I've developed a second version, which is being trialled at the moment in the makerspace. So um, yeah. hopefully, hopefully, some results will come well, from that. When, when it be, will be built, there's definitely yeah, yeah, yeah. space for it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, I suppose, the way I've approached approached this issue and and what I've brought to it. I'm not sure. I think there is a coming back to what Federico is saying. I think it's really important to look at policy and how policy treats this issue. So at the moment e-waste policy focuses primarily on manufacturers contributing money for the amount of stuff they produce. So if you produce 100 tonnes of dishwashers, you give this much. If you produce 200 tonnes, you give this much. And I think really the flaw in that is that it doesn't address how easy it is to recycle these things. So if I produce 100 tonnes of dishwashers that are really easy to recycle, I still put the same amount of money into the pot. And I think that doesn't incentivise businesses to address how easy it is to recycle their products. If they had an incentive to do that, they would. But at the moment, if I'm LG, I'm not going to spend the 50 million researching that and implementing that if I'm still going to pay the same amount of, of subsidies as the company that don't do it. Um, and that really is, I think, the crux of the problem and where it's not necessarily been addressed in the correct way in the past is that if you don't face the economic realities of the situation in Ghana, but also how it works in the West, then whatever solution you come up with won't, won't work out. So there's been um, initiatives to provide tools, hand tools, that would help people recycle. And that's a really good idea, but realistically, they're not going to do that when they can burn it all and not have to do any work. Um, I think that's about it. Has anybody got any questions? Mm. No? I just think it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. I'm so interested also in your other projects and definitely have a look at the website. Yeah, yeah. So don't close it. <laughs> yeah. So what is sort of the, the, the next step? What, what are your future ideas or what do you want to do with this further than uh, with MakerSpace? So I've actually started another business now that I'm working on full-time, so I don't have time to work on this. But um, I developed a second version of it and used the grant to, to pay two engineers to develop a more efficient version. So the, the problem with this is that you probably couldn't put enough material through it to encourage people not to burn. Because uh, at the end of the day, if you have to cycle for two hours, it will burn something. The likelihood is you'll burn it. A, a key thing is that the copper produced by this machine is worth 30% more on the market than if you burn it, because it's much cleaner. So you can sell it back to exporters for 30% more, which is the only reason anyone would, would really do it. 
Um, so the second version, you can get a lot more throughput through. Um, and hopefully, when that gets trialed, it'll be good enough that it would be implemented in, in, in Adblock Roshi. Also, something I didn't mention is that I designed this to be to be makeable in Adblock Roshi. So I only use tools that I found when I was there um, going around the dump. So uh, there are a lot of makers. I mean, the workshops there are better equipped than some engineering colleges. So are the makers already that uh, Rafa had met this summer are <coughs> also developing it and trying to, to see how they could? Yeah. Making it suitable for for Agboshi because mm. it, it's 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 quite rough as a yeah. as a as a place as we've uh, experienced. It's quite interesting. And another insight that was uh, that came out as well is that although the the, the copper is uh, pure because it's like in small pieces, it doesn't feel like the one that they burn and it just, that comes like as a lump. Like a big lump of Like a big yeah, lump yeah, yeah. of... Uh, so you also have to work really hard on, uh, on the, uh, the perception of, uh, of the, mat the material mm. quality, which is kind of uh, interesting. Yeah. <coughs> oh. Uh, I'm working in Roshi. I've been doing it in the past seven years. Um, working not just with the scrap dealers but with the community as a whole. But I know water is very expensive there. I'm yeah. just wondering, um, have you considered the supply of water for your project? So uh, the water just gets pumped around in the loop, so you don't need to put, it doesn't go around and, and then leave. So it just comes out of the basin, goes through a pump that's under the wheel and comes into this and then falls back into the basin. So you, if you fill it up in the morning, you wouldn't need to put any more water in that. So, okay. okay. And, do you, and then it's sort of a similar question. <coughs> um, there's an American inventor who's done something similar using uh, bicycle powered um, metal uh, um, magnet powered um, separator. Oh, cool. I haven't seen Rachel that. Field, do you know? No, 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 I haven't seen that at all. Um, I think you got there first because she's, she's just graduated last, last year and she did it did as part of her. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering whether it might be useful to, to make links with, with that. That'd be good, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you can use magnets on copper, but, um, but it would certainly be interesting to see other bicycle-powered recycling systems because I haven't seen them. It's not for... No, it's, it's something different. Circuits, right? it's, it's for the circuit... circuit it's a circuit board. board crusher. Right. Oh, OK. And it's using, basically using a, a, a normal crusher that you power using a bicycle. Yeah. But then... The, the, the two get separate because the metal goes one way and the um, plastic the plastic goes another way and she found by trial and error that speaker magnets in the back of yeah. speakers speaker units are just a thing right and so one of our projects is to kind of collect speaker magnets right, and right, right. just for this okay <clears throat> cool I was just thinking uh, it's quite common in, in Ghana in a small uh, solar panel to, to charge lamps to use during the night. If you just, just uh, let's say, uh, changing the, the, the human power with some solar, solar, solar panel. Yeah, so I kind of designed it so you could mount a motor, uh, especially the new one has been considered so that if you had a motor, you could stick it on. But um, the solar panels would never produce the power that you need to, to run it, unless you had a, a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.